I say, originally I was scheduled to go first. It's actually far more useful for me to follow on from Sam because Sam's picked up on a whole bunch of things um, that I'd like to be uh, sort of extending upon. Um, I think Sam's under under uh, under representing the work that he's doing. In point of fact, <laughs> um, so he's doing some really really you know, important work in you know, picking up on uh, um, some of the uh, the challenges we have in working with. Um, uh, with data and working particularly with the same, you know, uh, certainly the space that, uh, that Sam and I are in um, is working a lot with uh, what we would call tabular data. Uh, spreadsheets, you know, um, uh, data files, uh, CSV files and, and so forth. We, we, we work with these things a lot. Um, I work primarily in the academic space but I do cross over a lot into the government space. Can I just get a sense from the group here which which uh, sectors we might be? So who's from uh, what we oh, the library sector specifically? I'll, I'll talk about government sector in a moment. Who's specifically from the library sector? Okay, government sector. Yeah. <laughs> I say academic. Other <laughs> non-profits. I'd say is the other one that pops up quite regularly, and then then other. Okay. So I say the I'm not a librarian either. Um, my uh, my uh, background is I'm a PhD uh, in industrial relations. <coughs> Where I learned my trade was working my way through my PhD. Um, industrial relations is a, a an area where it doesn't really have its own disciplinary home. We're not biologists. I've done psychology. I've done political science. I've done economics. I've done. Uh, lots of things, I, and my role is very much to be thinking about how to put a whole bunch of things together in, in effective ways. Um, I also happen to be fairly good at statistics um, at the time. Um, you know, I sort of try to get my hand as much as possible. So I was working with data a hell of a lot, uh, working with um, collections of content uh, where I had to be able to integrate and work across multiple disciplines in you know in a variety of ways. So that, that background really brought me to working with, with data on a lot. And you'll find actually in the, in the data space a lot of people will come to this not from a particular direction. So I've worked for you know, the best part of um, 10 years now with the Australian Data Archive um, as Deputy Director and now as Director, but I started out 20 years ago working basically doing data storage and, uh, and processing uh, at, at Deakin University in, in Victoria. Um, and I say, um, data people come from a lot of different directions. I say, I'm a, com a computer scientist and a, and a statistician. I say, I'm a, um, a social scientist uh, moving into data. Uh, I say, certainly working with um, librarians, where I say, I've been involved in infrastructure programs, uh, working with a combination of social science and, and information science and library, uh, library science communities, uh, and trying to bring you know, a number of those groups together working with uh, groups like the, well, the University of Melbourne Archives uh, as well. Uh, and we all have very different ideas about what data is. Uh, and they're all correct, as it turns out. So, you know, say, so what I'm going to be talking about today is the sorts of data that we work with. But I'd say, I, um, certainly in, in terms of the way um, uh, um, we think about data um, and the sorts of things we have to do, um, Sam's provides some really useful you know, starting points to think about that. Uh, Ingrid's going to talk a little bit later, um, comes from the, the, the GLAM, I, I, that's a, the best acronym in the world. The, the, we, we talk a lot in acronyms, but the GLAM sector. Galleries, libraries, archives and museums. Um, uh, Karen you know, comes from, you know, has a, a, a multidisciplinary you know, view of the world, working across most of the academic uh, community in Australia. Um, and we all end up having to think about how do we have come up with shared ideas and shared understandings of what data is and how, how are we going to manage those things. So I'm going to talk today, I'm going to start with talking about what we do at the Australian Data Archive as one data infrastructure. Okay, and then I'm going to extend that out into uh, a broader discussion that we've been looking at in the Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences community about thinking about how we uh, build regional and national infrastructure. Um, at, at this point in time, um, the Department of Education in Australia has been working through how to develop a national program, a uh, 10 year program basically for supporting um, data infrastructure in Australia, particularly in the academic sector. Uh, and so the Australian National Data Service that Karen works for uh, is supported under that program. 
Um, my role you know, in, in recent times has been to be thinking about uh, what's the, the requirements for the humanities, arts and social sciences community. And that brings in CLAM, that brings in HAS, as that acronym after acronym after acronym. Mm -hmm. So if I do uh, come across an acronym that you, you, you haven't heard, and there'll be, there'll be many of them, um, okay, please pick me up on that. Spell HAS for everyone. Okay, so HAS, Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences. In point of fact, for most of you, uh, <coughs> the, say in the, the library community, as I say, we often get brought together in this space. I say that if they're under GLAM, galleries, libraries, aren't, you know, uh, archives. archives and museums. <laughs> Uh, the problem with having an A in any acronym, it usually stands, stands for AND, uh, or Australia. Uh, so, I've got two A's in my acronym. Um, but bringing, bringing content together, um, managing content, and actually increasingly connecting content together is, is part of what, we've, uh, what we're interested in. Uh, Sam's given us a great introduction to some of the government infrastructure that already exists. And one of the best infrastructures actually that we have in Australia sits here in this building. Um, Trove basically is considered to be uh, a data infrastructure. So if you've worked with Trove, if you've used Trove, increasingly that's seen as a, you know, a core part of Australian uh, data infrastructure. So as I say, I'll talk about um, what we do at, uh, at ADA as a starting point here and then extend that out into how we're thinking about uh, broader infrastructures. And you'll, as I say, you'll hear about other infrastructures throughout the day and you've already heard about some of them this morning. Data.gov is another um, that, that, uh, that we're covering. I'll talk a bit about um, data standards as well. Um, Sam's introduced you to, to, um, to the, uh, the key ones. Dublin Core, as I say, is, you know, is a key part of this. ANSLIC, as I say, we don't use that um, directly with, it, with uh, the Australian Data Archive, but as I say, abstracting out a lot of, there is a lot of you know, leveraging multiple standards um, that we're able to do as well. So standards do form a, you know, a, a major part of this, uh, this development uh, of, of data infrastructure as well. And that's a key part of us uh, when we're thinking about connecting up um, systems uh, that we're increasingly interested in is how do we enable um, systems to talk to each other. And that's the, one of the key purposes of uh, infrastructure. Okay, so let's say, I'm gonna talk through how we go about managing our data infrastructure to give you a sense of um, you know, the, the sorts of things that we do, and then let's say, uh, to, to fit in what Sam tonight is presenting in terms of some of the, the key ideas that, 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 that we work towards. So the Social Science Data Archive is what we used to be called. Um, then we became the Australian Social Science Data Archive, uh, which started with AWS, and we thought that that probably isn't going to work effectively as a... Uh, it's very hard to get away from having AWS in any name that includes Australia and social sciences. It's, so eventually we become the Australian, Australian Data Archive. Uh, we, let's say, we were set up in about in 1981, um, so we, we've been running for the best part of 40 years now, uh, over at ANU, uh, and our role is to collect and preserve social science data on behalf of the social science research community. Um, we've now got about 5,000 data sets. Um, the majority of those are from projects like um, national surveys that, that get run. Um, uh, from uh, administrative data collections. Uh, we work a lot with the ABS on the census data. Um, you, we find a lot that uh, most people aren't, well, the ABS in fact, uh, don't tend to work backwards from about the two censuses beforehand. If you look at your ABS and census statistics, they'll work backwards 2016, 2011, 2006. But academics are interested in 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. Um, the last time I spoke at a presentation like this, I said, well, maybe we could actually do something. It's 250 years if we, you know, if we try, you know, um, hard. It's very hard to count prior to um, uh, the English um, colonisation of Australia, um, but so certainly um, there, are, there is even work that goes backwards uh, beyond that as well. Um, the sorts of things we have to say, uh, election studies, public opinion polls. We've got a large collection of Roy Morgan's um, uh, polls that go back to the 40s. Um, a really interesting you know, description of all the sorts of questions you used to get asked uh, in public opinions uh, then. Um, 1947, um, we had uh, one of my favourite questions that are in there, um, is asking about um, uh, soldiers coming back from uh, Southeast Asia and you know, should um, uh, the partners of, of, of soldiers, uh, married partners, be allowed to resettle in Australia? And the framing of the, term, uh, the wording that was there was uh, should should um, uh, Asiatic wives be allowed to resettle in, in, with their partners back in Australia? 
So there's actually a lot of historical content um, uh, in the sorts of, the sorts of uh, materials that we have there. If you go back you know, a bit further, we have censuses. We actually did a, a project um, digitising the 1838 through to 1901 censuses. How do we manage all of that physical to digital content? We were working with third, third generation microfilm, actually, what we were extracting content out of. So how do we get content out of the microfilm that's been an image of the sorts of yearbook that Sam was talking about, get it into a, um, a, an electronic form, and then make it usable for, for researchers? My favourite thing that sits within that collection is um, there was a census classification uh, of idiots uh, in the 1890s. Um, there was also a census classification of um, uh, mental status by uh, occupation. So you could actually know how many idiot teachers there are in the, uh, in the 1890s. So you get a lot of the same. Um, Sam was talking about currency. Uh, certainly, you know, currency is important, you know, and having up-to-date information is there. But actually, a lot of the value in data is going backwards over time as well. So the more I can work backwards and look at long-term change in, in this range of population is a lot, a lot of the, um, uh, the researchers that, that I have are interested in as well. So I'm talking about the 1940s, I'm talking about the 1890s. You know, how do I describe change in Australia? You know, in 1933, uh, a third of the Australian population worked in agriculture. You know, we've, we've seen major changes and we have one of the key values of, of, of data and the importance of that infrastructure is to support, you know, being able to ask some of these questions. And increasingly, what we're interested in doing is connecting the dots between this content in an effective way. Um, things like national maps, things like data.gov.au, uh, a means for enabling people to be, able to, to be able to do that. So we work, you know, with all these sorts of collections. Our origins were in academic sources, but very early on in the piece, we started working with government um, data sources, and eventually in the private sector as well. And so Roy Morgan is, is a good example of that. We work in a, in a space that isn't entirely about, though, about open data. Um, so I'm going to say I'm a, a strong supporter of having open data and open <coughs> test content. When we start thinking about data, though, we start having to think about well, what happens when we can't have it open. And I know there's a problem you know, when you think about archives as well. What do you do when you need to have uh, you know, potentially disclosive information about individuals? How do you manage it? So one of the things I have to do is if you're thinking about how do I manage access, um, rather than think, so I'm thinking about accessible, not necessarily, yeah, rather necessarily about open. So that's another part of the infrastructure that I'm having to support is how do I manage the sort of the, the access to information where there's strong value in making it available for, for use, but there is strong potential for um, you know invasions of privacy and, and, and uh, undermining confidentiality uh, in there. I've got a fatal error on Citrix going on my machine oh. here. <laughs> Just ignore the fatal errors, yeah, yes. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> so, uh, we've progressively been, you know, uh, worked our way through to think about, you know, how do we go about structuring data? Um, how do we go about enabling discovery of content? You know, uh, so we have, you know, collections uh, that are, in some cases, are uh, by discipline, in some cases are uh, by method. Uh, a good example there is the longitudinal um, uh, studies. These are studies of individuals and households over, over time, following the same individuals you know, over very many, you know, a large number of years. Um, there's some, let's say, uh, some well-known uh, Australian federal uh, government uh, infrastructure there. The best part of probably half a billion dollars worth of data collection that's gone on in there. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and they, again, the more and more we are, keep, we keep collecting information about these individuals, the more valuable it actually becomes. Understanding change over time really allows to answer some important questions there. But the more and more we collect information about these individuals, so one particular data set that we're working with from Department of Social Services, there are 75,000 bits of information about a, a given individual that, that's it, you know, that become available. Um, how do you, you know, manage the risk of disclosure about that individual? Um, and so we have to think about you know, access policies and the like. Policy, procedure, security of these sorts of things we're having to build into, it, you know, into our systems. Um, so one of the questions about data infrastructure is what do you do when, you know, how do you match the sorts of infrastructure you need to the sorts of content you have available? It's not, let's say, I do love data.gov.au, but I can tell you I work with departments who don't want to use data.gov because of the, you know, some of the risks uh, that, that come along with it. 
Um, so how do we manage the, you know, those different types of content? And this is one of the things when you're thinking about the infrastructure for where to put things is what's the, the you know, how does it meet the, you know, the requirements of the type of data that you're having to deal with? Okay, <coughs> sorts of things, you know, um, so the sorts of, you know, topics we cover, um, a whole variety of different topics, a um, whole lot of um, this, but the sorts of, you know, things that are being collected there, as I said, we've, we've got uh, things like, um, you know, national, national comms, is this called? No. Uh, survey social attitudes, um, uh, is, and the national, Australian election, national election studies, basically collected to ask um, public attitudes and, uh, and opinions. Similarly, the Roy Morgan polls, we work with, um, uh, we don't have news polls, um, but things like that. Older collections, um, what sorts of data have we got in there? We, we tend to have images, we have text, we have H, you know, HTML, XML, uh, and the like. Um, census tabulations, you know, progressively become things like the table builder uh, that Sam had talked to you about. Uh, one of the more recent releases, um, the National Drug Strategy Household Survey. This is the, um, the collection that allows us to make estimates of the prevalence of drug use um, and alcohol and tobacco use in Australia. Uh, 25,000 people asking people things like, um, you know, in the last 12 months, have you um, actually, have you uh, used illicit drugs? In, you know, uh, how frequently are you using heroin? Etc, uh, etc. Et how do you manage access to that content? Now, for research purposes, that's, that's highly valuable. But the same as the security, you know, and, and confidentiality challenge that comes along with that. So, as I say, the, the sorts of systems we've been putting in place fundamentally are about thinking about, you know, the different types. So we don't have one system, uh, and as I say, the, the sort of uh, community of infrastructure that exists is designed to support these, these different types of content. Um, the drug strategy, you know, most of these are actually sitting in uh, the, the, the system I'll show you in just a moment, which is a thing called Dataverse. A bit like data.gov.au, but with some security management um, sitting alongside it as well. Our, our census tables, though, they're public records, so we have a, you know, a, a, a national you know, open browsing system uh, and a search functionality for looking through the, that content, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Increasingly trying to deliver into systems like National Map and, and, and related facilities. Um, there's usually a parallel academic facility alongside some of the government facilities that you'll see uh, as well. Uh, we tend to produce two of things in Australia. Uh, one for academic you know, communities and one for uh, government communities. Um, who, do we, who do we support? Um, well, our, our focus is on, is on supporting um, mostly researchers, I say. Uh, so undergraduates are about 50% of um, uh, our usage. Uh, some of them are uh, running things like tabulation, so doing um, comparison of data. Postgraduate researchers uh, are doing uh, a lot more of uh, analysis, so they need to get you know, the, the data files and, and use them in statistical systems. It might be in um, Excel, more likely it's something like uh, an analysis tool like SAS or SPSS and, and the like. Um, we get about 20% government use uh, and, and, and media use, and so I'm asking about you know, where people are from. Uh, about 10% of our use is from overseas, um, so people are interested in doing comparative studies. So uh, in those sort of circumstances, having comparative data and having comparative metadata, in fact, becomes a core part of the, the question. And a, you know, a number of our heavy use studies are actually studies that are designed to compare societies. So you know, some of the, uh, the data that I talked about earlier are supporting um, national and international uh, comparative research on uh, things like family and gender roles or uh, health or environmental attitudes. So what, what sorts of infrastructure do we, end up, do we end up having there? Well, this is, they say, this is the new system that we've been putting in place. This is... Um, uh, based upon a, uh, a standard that's derived from Triple One Seven Nine uh, that Sam talked about. So I would say the Triple One Seven Nine uh, ISO standard there uh, ex was extended to the start you know, supporting tabular data uh, and it used a standard called DDI, or data, the Data Documentation Initiative. Uh, the sorts of things that it enables, uh, enables us to do. Uh, again, we have um, uh, descriptive and structural metadata. So, Fundamentally, library catalogs are leveraging descriptive metadata. So a lot of what you see uh, in enabling access to data actually looks a lot like a library catalog. Uh, it's not, you know, 
uh, you're going from one thing so what's the difference? We use harvesting systems. So that we have our AI PMH harvesting um, to work. Um, we use Dublin Core, or we are actually able to you know, basically export out Dublin Core. There is some, there is some triple one, uh, one nine double one five G spatial metadata in there. So for discovery purposes, we, you know, what we're looking to do is say, does the description, descriptive metadata that we have allow us to be able to, you know, an, enable discovery effectively? For the most part, that's human discovery. Um, is particularly what we're focusing on there. Um, although increasingly, you say, um, uh, what the structural metadata is allowing us to do is enable machine discovery, machine to machine discovery, or actually con in interconnectivity. I quite like the sort of comparison that, <coughs> that Sam's made there. But a lot of what you know, what, what we're presenting in our in our catalogs and our systems here, is descriptive uh, descriptive metadata. We have standard terminology. Here uh, we've got. Data verses are our, our, our catalogs. Data sets are collections of files that describe a particular project, and then we have files. This is basically, you know, the starting point for this is, is a, a, a file storage system. Um, so I have a data set, Australian Survey of Social Attitudes. <coughs> it has a, uh, a, an abstract or a description. It then has, increasingly, yeah, and the important part here for um, academic researchers, it has a citation, <coughs> and this is this is starting to talk about provenance. The question that came up before about provenance is, um, say, how do how do we describe provenance? Well, the starting point for that fundamentally is is citation. You know, is sort of the mechanism in the in the academic community. Increasingly, it becomes about this particular thing here. Um, it's a DOI. <coughs> People familiar with DOIs? Another another acronym: Digital Object Identifiers. That's like, um, if, you're not, if you're not familiar, every journal article these days has one. Um, it, it allows us to drive a, you know, uh, uh, and follow uh, content and where it's been cited. If, if the academics or uh, researchers are using it, actually use the citation. And that's a big if. Okay. But this is part of the, again, part of the infrastructure. So we use the Australian National Data Services minting service for minting our, our DLIs that gives us you know, the capacity to cite and follow where data has been used. Just to think about provenance. <coughs> but people don't use the citations. And that's, yeah. So there is social and there is a technical infrastructure um, that's going along here. And part of what you have to think about here is who's using the social infrastructure uh, that exists. So a lot of what Karen's work is is actually on the social, <laughs> the social rather than the, uh, the technical side. Um, we have, um, as I, within that, then we have array two. You know, someone can you know, go into this data set. Do we have an internet connection? I think we did, didn't we? Um, we can take that further. Oops. Down the browser, I think that's right. Um, let's extend that a bit further. So we can drill into this a little bit further. Oops. like a library catalog to begin with, descriptive metadata. I have structures that I'm describing, you know, let's say varying terminology, but we really talk about collections and, and, and objects. <coughs> you know, if I take, if I, you know, wait my way in from there. I have um, uh, description, you know, uh, files. I have mechanisms for accessing those files. I have you know, access facilities. I have mechanisms for, you know, enabling or, or, or restricting access. So this is not dissimilar to the sorts of things we might do with physical archives or with, you know, with other collections. Some of the challenge, though, is, is in what you can do, you know, um, let's say, how far you can take that. Um, so, but, let's say, the sorts of metadata that we collect, um, I have you know, uh, publication dates, titles, other IDs, uh, authors. Now, this starts to look quite a lot like Dublin Core, and it turns out Dublin Core can be fully represented. So let's say we have an extract for, you know, for Dublin Core. We have geographic you know, information which is consistent with the ANSLIC 19115 information. We have author identifiers. So are people familiar with ORCIDs? That's one that, that maybe less so. ORCIDs are researcher identifiers. And they, they say they've picked up pretty quick in the academic space 
Um, they don't necessarily hold across um, all authors. That's like when you have academic <coughs> authors, or orchid is <coughs> really it's getting towards a de facto standard. Um, you know, they, they have grown to you know, quite a large number in a, in a very short period of time. Uh, and part of the, uh, the incentive there is um, they're not actually controlled by any given company. Um, so um, Thomson Reuters and, and Elsevier tried to start their own, didn't get so much traction. Um, uh, so this, is in, this is a system that stands outside of those publishers and can connect to them. Um, and it's a, it's a unique identifier for a, for a researcher, and it's the researcher own. Description, subjects, keywords, you know, etc. So these are things that you know, should be quite familiar. Uh, then we start getting into discipline specific. You know, well, there's some geospatial metadata, hands lick. <coughs> but then we start having to get into discipline specific content. So describing you know, things about the, the projects. I know there were sample size, there were 3,900 people who completed this survey. There, you know, who was the data collection agency? What sorts of surveys were it? So then we have to think about discipline specific content. Uh, and uh, that's where data starts becoming, getting away from you know, uh, other sites of publications. The other direction that it starts becoming challenging is when you start looking at, and Sam kind of touched on this, is getting to the data itself. I'm going to switch data sets here to give you a sense of this. Uh, election study, there we go. So, Australian election study, um, let's say this is one of our open access data sets. Um, uh, one of the things you can do um, with, um, with data that uh, uh, is you can make it accessible and make it analysable. So increasingly what we need structural metadata for is to be able to analyse it online. So I'm able to, uh, what I'm actually able to do, if I know the structural information about a, a tabular data file, is go and, and run uh, other sorts of analyses on this. So there's an interesting question about prominence is, if someone's able to derive something from my data set, is that my, my work or is that their work? Well it's actually both. Yeah, so starting, you know, so here I have, um, in point of fact, um, a capacity to uh, go on and I'm going to take the, uh, the information here. I haven't logged in. I don't need to on this particular case. Uh, I'm going to use it for other purposes. Uh, and other sources. I can accept that. I've got some some terms of use. Oh, that's right. Uh, just a I can accept that, and I can start building actually, this is actually online analysis systems. This is an overly, you know, uh, demanding analysis system, but here I have uh, information that's a variable about the, the mode of completion of this particular data set. This was a study that was done online uh, and, and by mail. Um, I have the division number of the uh, division of the electorate that the person was from, and I'm trying to estimate something about, you know, um, it might be about mode of completion. Structural metadata is, becomes important here because it allows us to start getting machines to talk to machines. So that's like, well, this is why I'm sort of you know, highlighting Sam's work here. What Sam's doing is they allow you to start thinking about how how is this concept related to that concept in that data set? How is this particular number? What does this number mean? A machine can only know what you what you give it. So the structural metadata they're increasing that then we, we do a lot of this work. Building this, this structural metadata, it's the thing that allows us to go from a humans having to you know, go and you know, use the information <coughs> ourselves. It's useful for humans, but it's particularly important for allowing to system to connect to systems. So the sorts of things that I need to run national map are the structural metadata that this is using ASGS uh, SA1, SA2, SA4. Yeah. That's what the structural metadata provides. And a heads up on, I say, this is my one concern with data.gov.au is it doesn't provide particularly good structural metadata. <coughs> that's, that's its challenge. Um, and I think that's where Sam's going with his work, frankly. <laughs> okay. So, how do we then fit that into a picture of, you know, of, of broader infrastructure? How long have I gone? Uh, five minutes. About five minutes, excellent. Oop. Sam's presentation there. It's a good so, just do it again. Which I can just do your one again. Okay. <coughs> I could do that. I bet you I've just hit go back to start. Haven't I? Nope. Yes, I have. There we go. All right. So, as you can start seeing, I say this is you know an example of the sorts of things that we've done, but it's not dissimilar to data.gov. 
Um, so we have an underlying metadata standard or several metadata standards. We have what actually is a discovery system. We've got some underlying structural metadata that allow, allow machines to work with each other. We've got um, you know, human and machine accessible content that's there. And we've got there's some things that we are familiar with. Cataloging systems, you know, uh, control vocabularies, um, keywords, terms of reference, Dublin Core. These are familiar spaces for us. Um, but then we're starting to have to think about well, where are we going next? And so I've, I've touched upon the idea of having to think, you know, uh, having to look at um, can we start connecting up systems and building national infrastructure? Um, so this is where um, uh, uh, where we're heading next in the humanities and so, uh, arts and social sciences is um, and the same certainly in in bio you know, uh, biosciences and, and other spaces this works you know uh, being done as well. Um, PASS is a bit behind uh, for various reasons. But what we've been up, you know, we were asked to do, um, the Academy of Humanities and the Academy of Social Sciences, was well, how do we start building sort of national infrastructure on this basis, connecting up you know, various parts of institutional infrastructure, which is what um, ADA is uh, and, and others uh, that you may have seen, uh, into what you might think of as a national system. So, um, Let's so say the, the area we're after, we're looking at is uh, humanities and creative arts, uh, social sciences, indigenous uh, content. Uh, being, uh, that work was being <coughs> developed by IATSIS. Um, in the timing that we were looking at, um, there wasn't the, the IATSIS weren't able to complete that work. We, we got a very very short lead time. We're talking three weeks um, <laughs> to do the first version of this. Um, uh, and a an integrated framework for connecting all this together. How do we start connecting the dots between the various infrastructures that exist? Uh, and some scenarios as to you know, the sorts of you know, how we might you know, um, fund it. Um, so, so um, basically, we, we try to develop a, a, an integrated you know, um, description of what a social sciences platform might look like, the humanities and the arts platform might look like. Um, uh, Ingrid was heavily involved in the humanities and the arts work as well. <coughs> we work then on the indigenous platforms. With, you know, we, we want that to be led by the indigenous community, so you know, that's sort of why it's basis leading that work. Um, what's the capabilities that exist and what sorts of cross-sector engagement might we need to do? And where we got to was trying to think about, fundamentally, what might, what are the sorts of things we might want to start doing and what are the, 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 part, the bits of the puzzle that are in place? Um, and this, this starts getting very ambitious um, because, as I say, we've got, you know, what we're trying to do is say, well, what's, you know, the range of things that the, 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 the variety of humanities, arts, and social sciences, you know, um, uh, researchers might want to do. Uh, and these are not just in the academic space as well. The government sector, the, the li libraries, the glam sector are a, a key part of this. Um, we try to look at the sorts of things we tend to see more in the social sciences and more in the, in, in the humanities. Uh, we also try to look at what, what's the sorts of facilities that we need to do to support you know, uh, the, the broad CAS community as well. And the sorts of things we're seeing there, things like discoverability tools. Um, you know, I mean, ADA's got, got one there, but Trove you know, becomes a you know, key starting point there. <coughs> we want to do digitisation. You know, digitisation is a lot, you know, how do we get stuff out of the National Archives? Um, Sam, Sam came up with the record of um, the, uh, the personnel records of the, the First World War soldiers. Now that's a, a fantastic source for being able to say something about you know, soldiers during World War I. There's a project though going on in the University of Tasmania which started <coughs> with um, digitising the colonial records of um, the, uh, the convicts that came out uh, to Tasmania in, in the early 1800s. There were, uh, I think it was 11, 11 ships overall um, and a number of, you know, a number of uh, waves. Fantastic record keepers, the English, they used to document you know, um, everything about the travel over cities and the travel um, to Australia itself uh, and the convicts once they are in Australia. Those convict records are in books, print record books, um, handwritten and described, you know, uh, described one by one. Now, that was done for people who were there arriving in you know, 1811, 1812. In 1915, 1914 to 1918, sorry, we had uh, a bunch of records that were collected about um, uh, the infantry uh, that went over for the World War One First Imperial uh, Australian Imperial Force. What researchers at the University of Tasmania and, and um, the University of Melbourne are doing is trying to look at the 
extent to which people who came over in the colonial ships, the, in the convict ships in, in, in 1811, and the food they ate and the clothes that they wore, to what extent did that affect um, the outcomes for people who, um, uh, who were their descendants 100 years and even 200 years later? They're actually using the, colonial, the convict records, the infantry records, to look at multi-generational health outcomes of being starved, you know, being, wearing you know, terrible you know, information. Uh, so we have a digitalization challenge there. They want us, but we have an analysis challenge. But my key thing is I've got to get the data out of those handwritten records into um, you know, something that I can use in a structured metadata one, it's into machine readable data. I've got to probably be able to map it and geocode it. Those populations moved out of southern Tasmania from Port Arthur and, and the like. They moved up to northern Tasmania. They moved into eastern, uh, western Victoria. They drove out the Aboriginal population of western Victoria. I can follow those records through there. I want to map it. I want to geocode it. I probably want to link it to other collections. I've got my, you know, my census record collection that I might be wanting to bring into the mix there. And then I want to publish that information, the convict records, the colonial, the, the infantry records, and I want to be able to discover it and link up those things up in an effective way. I have to do all of those things in order to be able to answer that question that the researchers at those two institutions are doing. So what we're trying to do is say, well, what's the pieces of infrastructure you need to have there? Digitisation facilities, data storage facilities, analysis facilities, geospatial and uh, GIS systems, etc., etc. These are the sorts of infrastructures that increasingly we want to be able to connect together in effective ways to be able to answer serious questions. You've seen some of those infrastructures already. We've tried to do a bit more work on what those infrastructures might be. Um, and say so some of them you'll hear from today. Ingrid uh, works at Arnet, um, which is the underlying network infrastructure, transferring data around um, yeah, uh, under the hood. And, you know, in terms of making data discoverable and accessible, natural computational infrastructure, strain urban research infrastructure is a spatial uh, facility. The population health research networks are a secure access facility where you've got confidential records that can't be made available, you know, over the internet. Um, and so on and so forth. So what we're trying to do is say, well, you know, how do we get these, you know, how do we leverage the metadata and the, and the data infrastructure that we have to start, you know, enable people to put these in locations, enable them to be able to describe them in effective ways and be able to allow them to then connect up those systems to be able to answer long-term, you know, um, major social science and humanities questions um, and what's the sorts of pieces we need to build. And this is sort of a framework for starting to do that. Trying to cover the 10 year framework for that has been an interesting exercise. This is just an introduction. That's it. Thank you.